So I'm Mike Breen, Public Awareness Officer for the American Mathematical Society, and I'm talking with Mac Hyman of Tulane University. And Mac has been telling us about uh, mathematical models and modeling uh, the COVID-19. We have a whole series of videos, and we're continuing today. And, and so, Mac, uh, can you tell us uh, you know, how or what's going on with these models in terms of the, the math community, I guess? Well, the, the math community is, is really focusing on two types of models. Uh, uh, the statistical forecasts, which identify underlying trends to kind of predict uh, where the epidemic is going and help us plan for, you know, what's going to be needed for hospitalization uh, and other medical supplies. But these models really can't answer the what if questions that are needed for guiding policy. You know, what if, what difference will it make if we reopen our businesses today versus in two weeks or three weeks? Or, uh, what difference does it make if people wear face masks in supermarkets? And for these models, we need uh, these predictions, these projections, we need mechanistic transmission models. Now, these models um, can follow up to millions of individuals as they go about their daily lives. And they can predict how the virus is transmitted through personal contacts or fomites where the virus is left on a surface and another person might touch the surface later on. Uh, and these, these are the types of models we can ask what if questions. You know, what if we require everyone in the supermarket to wear a mask uh, as opposed to making it voluntary and only half the people wear a mask? Uh, these models, since they're following individuals, can actually look at those kinds of questions. Now, because they have such detailed levels, um, they can take decades to develop and and dozens of programmer years. Now, the uh, NIH um, really recognizes that uh, this current epidemic, this pandemic we've got, is you know, not that big of a surprise. We're going to continue to have pandemics on a regular basis, whether it's Ebola, uh, chikungunya, the novel H1N1 virus, whatever. And we need the time to start building the model is not when you need it. They needed, we need to plan ahead of time. And about 20 years ago, NIH created a program called Models of Infectious Disease Agent Study, or MIDAS. And they started funding teams of modelers around the world to collaborate, collaborate to identify what are the best approaches to forecast and mitigate infectious disease transmission and to get the, the software and the models and the simulations in place. So when the current pandemic happened, they were ready to, to gear up quickly to create the databases, to, to transfer the models from other diseases to the current ones. And originally this group was a closed group of scientists and you were funded by NIH, NIGMS, you were allowed to kind of into the, the meetings and they were fairly small. In the past year, the MIDAS project is opened up to essentially anyone practicing uh, epidemic modeling in the world. And if you want to find out more about the initiative, the place to go is to their website, which is MIDASnetwork.us. And Mike, if you'd like, I'll, I'll take you kind of a flyby to the website to show what's going on. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I hope you wouldn't think I'd say no to that. Matt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> MIDASnetwork.us is the main website for the NIH program on modeling infectious diseases. From there, you can click through to the portal for COVID-19 mo uh, modeling. Well, you'll get general announcements um, such as collaborations, talks. The next talk is by John Drake on uh, July 31st on modeling infectious diseases. Uh, John is also the head of the Midas Steering Committee. So he has a very broad outlook over uh, all that's going on in the community. Uh, there are also links to uh, parameter estimates, um, data sets, uh, everything from the New York Times data set, the Chinese CDC data sets. Uh, parameter estimates, uh, both peer-reviewed and those that are being reviewed, as well as links to a GitHub repository for software. One of the guiding principles in modeling now is re reproducibility. And for complex computer models, 
you need access to software to be able to reproduce it. The other link on this website is for an open message for anyone involved in mathematical modeling and interested in modeling COVID-19 to join the research, join the mailing group. So by clicking through, um, there'll be a short form to fill out and uh, there's no fees. You'll get a, a regular updates on what's going on and encouragement to um, participate in the studies. What, what are the types of models of the people who have to make decisions? Uh, you know, policymakers, what, which ones are they uh, looking at? Okay. Well, the problem with models is, and you may have seen this in the paper, is that everyone looks different. And I, we keep using the analogy of hurricane predictions. We have the European model, uh, the US model, the Boulder model, and you know, it's much harder to predict epidemics than it is a hurricane. And so we have to be able to deal with this uncertainty. Now the Mod Midas has funded these large scale models, but they've always worked very closely with the Centers for Disease, Disease Control. And so in the past, oh, now probably about a dozen or so of the annual meetings for Midas have been held in Atlanta. And this is specifically to strengthen the collaborations with the epidemiologists at the CDC. And one of the problems with the MIDAS effort is that these models, these mechanistic models, can rarely be validated by real world experiments. And validation of models is an underlying key concept in mathematical physics and biology. Um, and when I was trained in, in, as a physicist, uh, one of the first principles is, is I learned is that when we see a physical system, we create a mathematical model that we think reproduces the system. And then we use the model to predict something that uh, we've never seen before, a new experiment where the model has not seen the data. And then this is validated by running another experiment. We don't have that luxury with the epidemic. The epidemic's data, we get what we get. The data is sparse, noisy, missing. The experiments are uncontrolled. Um, and it's only after the epidemic is over that we can look back in hindsight and say, well, if we had known then what we know now, how well we could do. And this is really not acceptable. And the CDC realized this, and about what was it, 2014, I think, they started uh, an annual contest to predict the seasonal flu. So they created a prize and says, whoever can predict the flu, the best will win, win the prize. Uh, first year, I think Jeff Shaman from Columbia won it. And he had to predict where the flu is going to be the next week, two weeks, when it will peak. And every week, you had to submit a new prediction. Uh, now, in the first few years of this epidemic, um, it was a real eye-opening experience to, mo to modelers, myself included, on just how difficult it is to predict uh, and forecast the future of an epidemic. Uh, the last few years, uh, uh, quite a few models came in pretty close. Um, our community is, is getting a reasonable handle, but it's not something you come in um, green and expect to do a good job on. So this, is, uh, this annual flu, seasonal flu prediction is now a central part of, of epidemiology, at least in the influenza branch at, at the CDC. And Two years ago, 2018, when the pandemic prepara preparation office of the National Security Council was dissolved, uh, the CDC went just the opposite direction. And they made a, a precedent step of funding what's called the Flu Forecasting Center of Excellence. And they funded five teams to create high quality mathematical models of forecasting epidemics. Uh, and these are Imperial College in London, University of Washington, Columbia, Northeastern, and University of Texas. Uh, most of these were central, also part of the MIDAS team. So they're not two separate groups of people, but it's an overlap. And the um, Lou Forecasting Center for Excellence and University of Massachusetts, uh, when the current coronavirus came on, everything was switched over from uh, predicting the flu to predicting the coronavirus. And so the CDC now has um, 
its own ensemble of models, just like the hurricane models. And if you go to the CDC COVID-19 forecasting website, uh, you'll get a weekly update of not just their five models, they've had other models that have joined them. Um, so I think at the latest week, there were eight models making predictions. And the models have different assumptions. Some are statistical, some are mechanistic. They use different data and they give very, very different projections. Um, a model I've worked on at Collaborate with the past is the Los Alamos model, which is part of one of the eight. And a few weeks ago, it was the most pessimistic of all the models. And then recently, it's one of the more optimistic models. So the rank ordering completely changes. Um, but the advantage of this ensemble is that you don't rely too heavily on one set of assumptions in much the same way that the wisdom of the crowd is often far better than the wisdom of any particular individual in the crowd. The, the current CDC ensemble model, um, by taking the median of the models, is somehow taking um, the best in, in, in the sense that it, it kind of gives less weight to the outliers and more weight to the consensus opinion. Now, so, so just, sorry to interrupt, Doc, but, but a lot of people know what median is, uh, but you know, so a median is when you rank a numbers in order, let's say, and you take the one in the middle, not, it's not the average. Right? Yeah, and it switches. Not the mean, right. So if you want to look at the, if you want to look at long-term forecasts, you don't pick one model. You may switch from one model to a next, mm -hmm. and it, uh, you know, as you go forward. Mm -hmm. And in the past flu season predictions, the ensemble models have always been among the top. Uh, in the current AI predictions around the country, the AI contest for, you know, recognizing images and things, mm -hmm. it's the ensembles that almost always win. And the other thing that the ensemble approach does is that when you have an ensemble of models, you have outliers. And when a model is an outlier, either there's something wrong with that model that needs to be fixed, or there might be something that the other modelers are missing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this is kind of a common saying among modelers. Uh, when we get something that we least expect is when we learn the most. And so when we do this ensemble and we see a model that's kind of going off into left field, we say, ah, that's where we need to, to focus our attention. So, uh, so Mike, I actually, I'd like to, to take a, to go to the CDC website, if you'd like. But, yeah, but just real quickly, uh, you were talking about, you know, the getting better at predicting. So let's just say with flu cases or deaths, if, if I had a model and it was within, I'll just say, you know, what, what's a good number? If I was within 5% of what actually happened, would that be good? 5% um, of what? Uh, so let's say total <laughs> so cases. And I, I predicted. Yeah, yeah. So, there, so the, flu, the, the flu prediction models and the contests are rated not just on how you have to predict how many cases will be in one week, two weeks, oh, a month mm -hmm. out when the peak of the epidemic will be, and often the flu season, there are double peaks. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, one of the controversies about this is how do we rank one model versus another when there's so many different criteria to use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so uh, it might be good one week and not good another week. And then also it might say the, the peak would have been in February when it turned out it was in March. And so it's a time uh, aspect to it as well. That's, that's correct. And, and so if you were, you know, let's say, running the world uh, and, and you were faced with all these models, how would, how, and, and like you were saying, you know, the, 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 the predictions or forecasts change. Uh, and then would you, would you say, I have a lot of confidence in this ensemble one and go with that? Or what would you do? I would, right now, I would, uh, I'd have the most confidence in the ensemble of the models, okay. not any one model in particular. And if I was running the world, I would, there are other models out there. Um, uh, Georgia State has a wonderful uh, system for modeling, not just the US, but Europe and China mm -hmm. as well. And so only having eight models is pretty sparse. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, finding funding and finding support so other models can join this ensemble uh, would, would raise the bar for everybody. All right, so sorry to put you on a detour there, Mac. Yeah, so let's get to the uh, CDC model you were talking about. Okay. Uh, and so we'll head over there. Every two weeks, over 20 
mathematical modeling groups from around the world submit their forecasts to the Centers for Disease Control. The CDC then combines these to give an ensemble forecast of what the most expected behavior of the epidemic will be in the coming weeks. Uh, the methods are the different forecasts range from statistical forecasts that are based on individual states and combined to mechanistic models, agent-based models, differential equation models, and often have very different assumptions about the future behavior changes. Uh, so they create these spaghetti-like plots, much like what you see in hurricane uh, forecast, to give an ensemble model uh, with 95% confidence bounds. Uh, these are the models for the, the deaths. You can also uh, have models for uh, hospitalizations. Not as many modelers do that. You can go back in time and see what the forecasts were a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, you can download individuals' uh, state forecast, which is, is, and you'll see some um, states in the U.S., such as Alabama, uh, have very broad, very wide um, confidence bounds, variance bounds, uh, whereas others, such as Connecticut, have very tight confidence bounds. So it's all based on local information. Uh, you can download the forecasted data and do your own forecast. Uh, the sites, all the forecast groups have links uh, to their home institutions. So for example, if you go to Los Alamos National Lab, um, you'll get a, you can uh, zoom in by state, find out what's going on. Oops, uh, you can then get a model description. Uh, links to papers, uh, publications, uh, detail, find out who's on the team. And most of these people are very open to collaborations. And uh, connections of Midas to the CDC are very strong. And so if you're at all interested in getting involved, um, the place to start is probably the Midas uh, COVID-19 working group and take it from there. Thank you. Hey, Mike, I hope this explains a little more about kind of what's out there and what the current state of modeling is. And there's, there's room for everybody to participate. Is there anything we missed? Anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, Mike, I think that's, uh, I really want to make people aware that um, uh, of these models and the direction that at least the, the models for decision makers are going. This doesn't mean that we don't need the compartmental simplistic models to gain understanding and how this is, is going on. But when we start making policy decisions where lives are at stake, uh, we need the best models that we can get. These take years to develop and one model is not enough. Uh, we need lots of different viewpoints on this. So. Uh, and, and so when you said that, it made me think, sorry, uh, but uh, you know, let's suppose I'm, I'm, I'm a, a president at a college campus or university campus. I'm all set to open up. Can, can someone there or, so, or someone in the math or stat department at that university use some of these models to? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, some of the models are, um, are very open to the public. I mean, one of the, the guidelines for CDC is that, you know, we, uh, the, the mathematical foundation, a statistical foundation between underneath these models has to be clearly explained so anyone could reproduce the results if they needed, and the data needs to be made available, available. So some of the modeling links from the CD website, CDC website and from the MIDAS website will lead you to the codes and the data. Uh, and okay. so what you would need to do is replace the data they use with your own data. Uh, but again, um, you have to be very careful because we all can gain too much confidence in, in, in running our own simulations. You need that little gremlin on your shoulder saying, remember, this is only a model. Uh, all right. Well, Mac, uh, thanks very much. That, that, that was very interesting. Uh, and that's Mac Hyman from Tulane University uh, talking about the uh, models and showing us uh, some sites uh, for mo modeling COVID-19, the epidemic, the pandemic. Uh, thanks, Mac.